Welcome back to Insight Review as we look back on the defining stories of the past seven days. International prosecutors investigating the downing of the Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 say there is no doubt the missile that shot down the plane was brought into Ukraine from Russia. The Dutch-led joint investigation team says it was a book surface-to-air missile fired from rebel-controlled territory. The 2014 attack killed all 298, mostly Dutch passengers and crew, on board. Thousands of wiretaps, photographs, witness statements and forensic tests were examined. Taking into account the large amount and diversity of the other evidence that the GIT gathered, we have no doubt about the correctness of the conclusions that we present today. And the conclusion is that flight MH17 on 17 July 2014 was brought down with a buke rocket that was launched from the agriculture field at Pervomysk, and that the missile system arrived from the Russian Federation and was returned there afterwards. We can discuss this with our guests, the broadcaster Lisa Aziz and David Hurst from Middle East Eye. Um, Lisa, this kind of told us officially what we already knew, didn't it? I think so, but goodness me, you have to feel for the families of the 298. When they hear this definitive from JIT evidence that it was Russia's fault, and then they hear from the Russian Foreign Ministry, literally not us, nothing to do with us, the, uh, the findings are biased and politically motivated, I mean, your hearts must just go out to them, what they must be feeling at this point, that Russia just keeps on denying it. And I think it probably will bring up um, the question, there's been talk uh, that it could lead to a question of sanctions against Russia, despite their denials. But, you know, there's implications with that, isn't there? Um, because you know, you know, Russia now so involved with, with, with Syria in particular. So I think Russia has to be treated very carefully with this. But your heart just goes out to, the, to all those families who are now listening to the Russians saying, nothing to do with us. As we're recording this program, David, they've been called in, the Russian ambassador, for a bit of a talking to. But these things are gestures, aren't they? They don't, won't amount to much. Yes, alas, I think they, uh, they are gestures. You've only got to look at what happened uh, with very, very strong evidence against uh, Dmitry Kovtun. Uh, in the murder of Alexander Litvinenko in London, the Polonium murder. Um, he was basically awarded a post of uh, Duma deputy. Um, and the Russian constitution uh, bans Russian citizens from being extradited abroad. Um, I think what will happen, I think as Lisa said, is that it will continue the pressure of sanctions, European sanctions, yeah. over Ukraine on Russia. But will you get international justice? I doubt it. Because the, the argument, I suppose, the Russians would say, well, it might have come in from our territory, but we didn't press the button. But that, even that is being tested, isn't it? Because the skill required to fire this device would certainly recall somebody who's well familiar with the, um, with the equipment concerned, this book missile launcher. Would this it? is not just a man pad. This is an extremely uh, complicated missile system. It's on something uh, uh, you know, as big as this studio. Um, it, it but also what, the targeting, you know, the heat seeking or whatever, or whatever it was. It takes 15 needed. minutes to target, but exactly. it was also smuggled back out. It was smuggled in to, to Ukrainian territory and then it was smuggled back out the moment this happened. I mean, there is some evidence. There was, uh, at the time I remember it, uh, the Ukrainian services uh, produced a, 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 a phone conversation between a, one Russian commander and another, a rebel commander, and they thought they had hit uh, a jet and uh, the commander said no, 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 actually it's a passenger jet. Mm. So there is, there is, there is something, that all happened in Russian, uh, there is some circumstantial evidence that, that, that this was a genuine so tragedy. So maybe you, what you, this wasn't necessarily the intended target and, and it was a hideous mistake, perhaps due down to inept targeting or confusion in the skies or whatever it was. And I remember that, I remember that um, uh, when those media reports came out, but the detail is all in here, isn't it, from the JIT. The missile was a Russian-made 9M38 surface-to-air uh, BUK book rocket, um, and that it was launched from a pro-Russian rebel-held village in eastern Ukraine. What One wonders how, they can, how can they dispute that? Okay. And th th there is one more detail to that, and they actually found a piece of shrapnel inside the body of the pilot. Yeah. Uh, and that shrapnel relates to, there are two versions of this missile, this is specifically a Russian-made missile. David, thank you. Next we're going to Colombia. History was made there this week with a peace accord to end the 52-year war with a FARC guerrilla group. Presidents and dignitaries from around the world were in Cartagena to watch the deal being signed by the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, and the leftist rebel leader, Timochenko. TRT World's Sandra Gathman reports. 
They came dressed in white. Hundreds of war victims, dignitaries, and presidents from across Latin America here to witness history. And with the stroke of a pen made from a bullet, the deal was sealed to end Colombia's 52-year-old war with the FARC. What we have signed today is a statement by the Colombian people before the world that we are sick of the war, that we do not accept violence as a means to defend ideas, and that we say loud and clear, no more war. No más guerra. Ofrezco sinceramente perdón. In the name of FARC, I sincerely apologize to all the victims of the conflict and any pain caused during the war. It was a truly spectacular show. The whole country was tuned in to see the FARC and the Colombian government commit to building peace together. But many Colombians know this is only the start of a great deal of difficult work ahead. The country's political opposition are against the FARC entering politics and made their voices heard in Cartagena too. Why, fellow Colombians, do we need to allow the most dangerous criminals to be able to aspire to the Colombian presidency? Colombia's future may be uncertain, but hope for peace has never been stronger. Well, Lisa Aziz and David Hurst are with me. David, this is not going to be easy, just turning a page on 52 years of what was a war. This is a huge moment. Um, when you consider how many people died and how long this conflict went on. And we've heard from that clip, the previous president, Uribe, dead against it. Mm. Um, I think they're going to be really big. Firstly, there's the, the, as in Northern Ireland, there's going to be the question of decommissioning. Will the 7,000 guerrillas actually uh, turn up within yeah. 28 Will they zones? hand over their weapons? Given will they hand over all of their weapons? Will, will, will there be a split or, 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 or whatever? But the other thing, of course, is uh, justice. Uh, war crimes. Who, who, who is going to be uh, considered a war crime? What is the process going to be? Every, this, is, this has been a tortuous case in everywhere where this has happened in Northern Ireland, in South Africa, yeah. um, and now here. But it is a very, very big event. Um, and both sides have been totally applauded. For and it. the lesson, I suppose, from those two places, progress can be made, but maybe not expect it to be easy. It won't well, no, I come simply or quickly. Will just it? going on from what um, David was saying, I think what's angered an awful lot of people, this particular accord, is that the rebels are now allowed to enter Congress. An awful lot of them haven't even served any jail time. So they'll be worried about their behaviour going yeah. forwards. And I'm sure they'll be, you know, closely monitored. Well, that goes on around the world. I mean, rebels turn into <laughs> politicians, <laughs> don't they, eventually, um, if they're going to... If I think, I think they will be watching forward. the 7,000. Also interesting, I think, the number of people coming to this, um, the ceremony, the big ceremony, some 2,500 people and, um, you know, Secretary of State Kerry and, uh, and all sorts of people coming from all, all around the world, um, a UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So at least they're... I think at the actual ceremony, being so big, at least there'll be this great will and support. There is goodwill you know, from around but, the world they want to, it try to and, work. try and make this thing work. But goodwill alone, David, won't necessarily... Think. It's telling, I think, how you hear passionate argument on both sides, don't you? From those who were even imprisoned or have lost family members, who are still advocates for the peace process. Similarly, other people who've suffered, dead against. This is a very, very brutal war. Um, and... Uh, there are no angels in it. Uh, you know, Fox, it, this started over land and it ended up over drugs. Mm. And, uh, and the conflict degenerated. And there was an enormous toll on, on, on both sides, uh, both in terms of what FARC did and also in terms of what the right-wing paramilitaries did. Uh, and civilians suffered all the way through. To erase that memory from you know, my experience, for instance, of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, what you have is a, is a political peace, but on the ground, if you're, if you're really going around East Belfast, Bel Bel West Belfast, those walls are still up. Uh, this will take a long, long time to simmer down. Well, on it's the ground. generations. If you think 52 years of conflict, that's yeah. two, three generations of families will know only warfare. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're going to have to cross our fingers for a good few years yet. So and I had no idea. 20,000 fighters at its strongest. No. It is an extraordinary level of involvement, isn't it? For good or bad. Well, it's going to be difficult, but we wish them all the best. Uh, Lisa, David, thank you both very much. We end now with our Insight Bite. This is a little something that we feel you should know. Now, every wedding has to have plenty of photos with both the families. But here's a wedding photo shoot with a difference. I think you want to jump with that. 
This couple got something of a shock when a well-wisher who crashed their wedding photos turned out to be none other than Tom Hanks. The Oscar-winning actor was jogging through New York Central Park when he came across the newlyweds and decided to congratulate them. Photos capturing that moment have had over a million hits online. And apparently it's not the first time Hanks has crashed a wedding. Back in 1993, he was spotted pulling up outside a church to congratulate a bride and groom during the filming of Forrest Gump in South Carolina. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Insight Review.